what went wrong in Turkey uh, in the context of your book and in the context of where Erdogan has gone deeply off the rails on this sort of stuff? And again, I answer that however you want, because it's a obviously it's a massive question. And obviously you're not dealing with all of the aspects of, um, you know, the state and, and, and economic elements. But maybe talk a little bit about how what what preceded Erdogan made Erdogan possible. Well, we should have another discussion about that, Damir, for sure. Mm. Uh, but uh, just uh, briefly, what went wrong in Turkey? You you probably would know that I was quite optimistic about Turkey's direction a I decade remember. ago. Yeah, I, remember, I mean, I was yeah. saying Turkey has an Islamic liberalism in the making. And I think that was true for the early years of the AKP, when uh, AKP as a post-Islamist party committed itself to the European Union accession process and the liberal reforms required by that process. And I think some people in the AKP, AKP being Justice and Development Party, Erdogan's party, really believed in that Islamo-liberal synthesis, as I called it, actually, in my book 10 years ago, in my earlier book. But there was also a purely Machiavellian and tactical element to it, Mm. which I think was precisely what Erdogan uh, was committed to. And once he uh, got himself uh, saved from the wrath of the secular military and consolidated his power, he lost interest in reform and he just started to see the world not from a Copenhagen criteria, as we used to call, but more like a Russian Putin-esque kind of model of power. And that has uh, gone deeper, deeper, deeper. And And of course, Erdogan has been able to do this because Turkey's religious conservatives have a grudge against the secular elite for being sidelined and oppressed for at least for a century, almost for a century, which is true. That's why actually I was very critical of Turkey's illiberal secularism, French style, even more aggressive than France, laïcité. And Erdogan has been surfing on this historical us versus them sort of thing. And he took a clearly authoritarian direction after some point. Erdogan is not the only actor, I should say, responsible for this grim scene, but probably he's the main actor. And today, Turkey is really, really a sad story. And I see it as probably the biggest disappointment in my life so far. But I still hope that Turkey has enough democratic and liberal potential to outgrow this overreaction to Kemalism and Kemalism in reverse. I mean, I think Erdogan is building himself as a new Ataturk, like just the savior of Turks again, but from an Islamic conservative view. But I hope Turkey has outgrown Kemalism. I hope it will outgrow Erdoganism as well. So then Turkey might be the model that I hope that it would at some point. But for that, it needs a moment of reconciliation and uh, it needs a Tunisia moment of 2003. Its economy is already better, but it has to fix up uh, uh, its politics. One challenging question, Mustafa, about that that I struggle with about Erdogan and the Turkish experience, which once was the Turkish model but is no longer, is um, the question of whether Erdogan's authoritarianism is tied to his Islam or if it's tied to Turkey's longstanding political culture of strong men, which precedes Erdogan. And as you mentioned, secularists were doing this as well, um, sometimes even to, to a greater degree. And there were obviously ostensibly secular military coups, um, you know, uh, peppered throughout Turkey's history. And I think that actually gets to part of like your fundamental, the fundamental questions that you raise in your book, when we're trying to understand why people do bad things when they're Muslim, it's hard to know how much of it is because they're Muslim or because Islam is causing it in some ways. Very good question, Shadi. And I will say it is complicated and it's a mixture of, I think, all those different dynamics that you rightly pointed out. When you look at into Erdoganism today, which I call Turkey's official ideology, it is a mix of all the pathological elements of Turkish culture, political culture, which is a cult of personality, you know, which probably you don't have in the Muslim Brotherhood, right? I mean, do you have a cult of personality sort of leadership in the Muslim Brotherhood? No. I no. doubt. Turkey has that. You know, Turkey is a country of Ataturks and all the great heroes that people, you know, see as kind of demigod and secularists had that through Ataturk. And Erdogan has built an alternative version of that. So 
there is a heavy dose of nationalism. Erdogan has Maoist allies that people don't know outside of the West. I mean, one of his staunchest allies is the pro-Chinese uh, Do Perinçek, who is the founder of Turkish Maoism. So it is not a simply Islamist issue. But also when you look at the political narrative and the sentiment of Erdogan and the Erdoganists, you certainly see them justifying themselves as leading the holy cause of Islam and the glory of the Islamic civilization. There is a big passion to be the superpower of the Islamic civilization again, the, de the defender of the faithful. And uh, of course, in a very anti-Western, decidedly anti-Western language, I'm saying that because they are not not accidentally saying anything to China about the Uyghurs. So if you're going to defend Muslims, probably you should defend from all oppressors. But it's a mixture. But I do think it is a failure. It's, it's an important failure in a test of political Islam being compatible with, with liberal democracy. We are seeing that it can be compatible with illiberal democracy just like Hindutva uh, in India. But I, what I want for the Muslim world, my ummah, is liberal democracy.